Thank you very much, Tim, for that <coughs> kind introduction. Good friend, and, and uh, you get brownie points from me. You might not get paid for, for giving me a shout out there, but um, hey, and, and I, as he mentioned, I do give a shout out to um, Healthy for Life University and Healthy for Life in the book. Uh, by the way, it's page 23, if you're wondering. That's the shout out, chapter two. And thank you, all of you, for coming tonight. I uh, want to first start off by asking, uh, who thinks they may have come here from the furthest distance? Uh, who had to travel the furthest distance here? Raise the hands. Let's see them here. Who traveled here the furthest? Yes. Ogden. Ogden, Iowa. I did a triathlon there once. My first triathlon was in Ogden. It was an hour, hour and a half? Yeah. Anyone else? Top an hour? Cool. Ten hours. 700 miles. Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> My partner Amanda and I got in a few nights ago. That's where we live now. I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa, as Tim alluded to. And it's an honor to be back in this building for this building and the people that are leading here, Brian, uh, in the back of the room. I had a chance to work with them early on in my career in the health and wellness space and uh, representing uh, Healthy for Life University in the employer space. So knocking on doors of companies, bringing in this great curriculum, and Tim's not blowing smoke up any of you guys' uh, telling you the, how good this program is. And if you guys have been through, it's, it's a, an amazing curriculum that helped to spark a lot in my journey. And that's what I'll share a little bit about tonight. It's my journey, ultimately, uh, to my work today. And that is uh, helping people become health hackers. So tonight's talk is titled, Becoming a Health Hacker. Seven simple habits you need in 2019 if you want to stress less, live more, and fuel your lifestyle with clean, sustainable energy. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive right in today. We're going to cover, this is what you're going to learn today, and, and we got about, uh, you know, maybe hour 15, hour and a half. We're going to be efficient, we're going to be effective with everyone's time, because I realize just by showing up here, you know, time is valuable in this world, and so you want an outcome, you want a return on your time, and so this is the return on your time. What we will focus on are those seven simple health hacker habits to master in 2019. And that's the what. Then we'll get into the five P's of health hacking. These are core principles found in the book, <coughs> The Art of Health Hacking. Next, the three biggest mistakes most people make in their health and how to avoid those mistakes along the way. Number four, a powerful self-coaching exercise to help you create clarity in your own journey for better health. Number five, habit Tracking and Stacking 101. This is some of my favorite cutting edge stuff when it comes to the art and science of behavior change, which I'll share in a little bit about my background in that space. But habit tracking and stacking are ways to help stack the deck in your favor, if you will, so that you can have the outcomes with longevity, energy, just performance, and your health that you desire. And then we're going to get in, if you stay till the end, my two bonuses here are energy multipliers, my top 20 health hacks to optimize health, energy, and longevity. And bonus, if you stay till the end, I will share some of my healthy paleo recipes with you to help upgrade your cooking and your baking. Side tangent, my partner Amanda and I are working on a couple's cookbook together called Kitchen Chemistry, and that will come out next year, but you'll get, if you stay till the end, a few of those early recipes. Uh, and we're all about eating for pleasure and performance simultaneously. So one of the things we love to teach is how to trade up on healthier ingredients. So how can we health hack pizza, bread, uh, ice cream, cookies, you name it, because that's possible. We no longer have to have like guilt or negative emotions around consuming the foods we love the most if we learn how to upgrade our ingredients and get creative in the kitchen. So we'll share some of those recipes at the end. So who am I? Uh, background on myself, I'm a clinical health coach and a health hacker, and I'll share a little bit more about what I mean about what it means to be a health hacker later on. I'm the author of the book that Tim alluded to, uh, which took actually four years to produce, three years of writing and one year of editing, and it was written as a uh, self-coaching guidebook based on my own health hacking journey, my adventures personally in optimizing my own health. Uh, as well as helping supporting others doing the same. Uh, another part of my background, I was the past mascot at the University of Iowa. 
and I can guess, you can probably guess which mascot that was, right, in this room. Uh, good old Herky the Hawk. And I actually uh, have my own issues in my tissues uh, <laughs> from in some injuries around being Herky. Um, I believe everyone has issues in our tissues. It's, it's about just getting clear on those. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I had to hack some areas of my health from that. I also went to the ER while writing this very book. And you might be wondering, why are we at a talk where the speaker and the author is admitting to what most people would perceive as failing in their health, going to the emergency room? Uh, you know, why are we to trust this person after biohacking his body a bit too much? And it's what I learned from that experience that will be the golden nuggets for you guys. Chapters 11 and chapter 12, specifically in the book, really get into that idea of how to build your all-star healthcare team and tap into advanced testing to help you customize. So that's what I'll share from that experience. And overall, I have a really deep passion for empowering people to truly use their health as an asset and not a liability throughout their performance. So that's a background on myself here. This is the main premise of the book, okay? So we do not lack the science, information, or technology to live healthy. Rather, we lack the art to know how to use these resources effectively. So how can we become more creative, more artful in our approach towards creating the health we desire in our own life? That's the main premise of the book. And so, uh, and it's also, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, self-coaching guidebook. So it's designed to help you become your own health coach in your own life, to take your health into your own hands. Use the science and the art of sustainable behavior change to know how to sustainably integrate high leverage healthy habits that are of most value. The least amount of effort to generate the biggest resort, uh, biggest impact. That's what I like to say. We explore the art and science of behavior change, plus the emerging trends, as uh, Tim alluded to, uh, in the worlds of healthcare, biohacking, longevity, uh, and what that means for us today as health hackers. And overall, it's built on this very idea. If you pay, take something away from the beginning of this talk, it's built on this idea that we do not lack the health experts in the world. We lack the self-experts. Our greatest opportunity to move the needle in our healthcare system is to inspire more personal accountability in our health so that we can take our health in our own hands and have more confidence and, and more momentum and motivation throughout that journey. How does that sound for people? Does that sound good? I see some not, awesome. So this is cool. So that's background on the book. So who are the health hackers? This definition, uh, health hackers, explains who these types of people are. Health hackers are people who take true ownership of their health with the intention and attention. So intention being the why, attention being the what of their health uh, to hack, track, and stack, as I like to say it. I might be working on a rap song, hack, track, and stack it here. <laughs> to the most important areas of your own health. And later on today, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna get into how we use these tools for habit tracking and habit stacking to actually make a difference in our health. And overall, th this is uh, something I get into early on in the book is like, what is health hacking? So if health hackers, if this is your definition of health hackers, health hacking is an efficient and an effective self-coach approach. Uh, did anyone hear me on the radio this morning on 1040? I think a few people were tuning in. So that's, I, 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 he asked me that question, what is health hacking? And it is an efficient and an effective self-coach approach that gives you the tools to truly move the needle in your health, build your own all-star healthcare team and your self-care strategy. That's the focus. All right, so my story, personally, I dove head first into health and really never looked back. And you learn by doing, right? And you know, I, I learned as I got into the quantified self industry, the biohacking world. Has anyone heard of a company called Bulletproof before? We have some hands being raised. So Bulletproof is a health and biohacking company. Dave Asprey's the founder. He created this coffee first called Bulletproof Coffee, and I was an ambassador. This is me leading a demo, a Bulletproof Coffee uh, ambassador leading a demo in Lululemon about four years ago out in West Des Moines. And Bulletproof Coffee is uh, organic coffee beans. So you, have, you make your coffee and you mix it and blend it with two healthy fats, grass-fed butter, 
so butter from grass-fed cows, and MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides, which is highly concentrated coconut oil. Okay, as opposed to having sugar with your coffee, you're having healthy fats, keeps your blood sugar low, gives you physical energy, mental energy, and it can be a really powerful tool. I was also experimenting with something called a ketogenic diet. Raise your hand if you've heard of a ketogenic diet. I see lots of hands go up on that. Yeah, yeah, it's all the rage these days, right? And for good reason, it can work to bring health, restoration, and to burn body fat and lower inflammation. There are lots of valuable opportunities to use the ketogenic diet, but it, you have to look at things historically as it relates to nutrition, and that was typically used therapeutically, not lifestyle-wise. And I used it lifestyle-wise and for performance, right? There's a lot of people out there that will use it for performance to give them more mental focus and energy because a ketogenic diet helps to create an alternative energy source called ketones, okay? I won't go down the rabbit hole and all of that, but that's just kind of a foray into that. I was using this tool, getting into keto, using Bulletproof Coffee, working really hard, and before I knew it, I ended up in the emergency room later that day. After the demo, we go out to brunch with my family, and I go to the bathroom to check on myself, and I'm kind of feeling woozy. Had a green tea there at, at brunch as well, so I had coffee earlier, green tea, and I've been working really hard. My body was just burnt out, and before I know it, I come and slowly fall to, to the ground on all fours, all, all four, just like this, and I, I can't walk anymore. And I'm about ready to pass out. I'm kind of going in and out of consciousness. My family comes over. They move me over to a booth. My sister, mind you, her daughter has food, bad food allergies. So before I know it, I get an EpiPen lodged in my right leg. <laughs> Boo! That'll wake you up. Five minutes go by. Still not feeling well. We haven't decided. Are my parents going to drive me to the ER? Am I going to call for an ambulance? And we decide on a second EpiPen. I got a second EpiPen in my left leg. <laughs> Suffice it to say, we called the ambulance. I go to the ER. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, maybe for some of you, didn't really get many clear answers in the ER. Not the best place to, you know, the, it, it, a lot of issues in the healthcare system, which I talk about in the book. And, and so I didn't talk to a doctor, to what I recall. I didn't. No one told me what was going on. I had these guesses. I still thought it was a food allergy. And then I'm piecing everything together the next few days and realize, I don't think this is a food allergy. I think this was a dehydration issue. And that's what it was. Two days later, after this experience, you know, uh, you know what the F happened to me? This is scary. Um, I'm fine, really, wink. Uh, OK, time to leave. And, and it was time to leave. Two days later, I was on a one-way flight to San Diego, California. And these were my rebel stages. Mind you, I was in the middle of writing this book. So when I said earlier chapters 11 or 10, 11, 12 are important, that's because they didn't exist before this happened. After this happened, it spawned two or three more chapters in the book. So the woman on the left you see is uh, a naturopathic doctor, my personal doctor to this day, as well as a business partner of mine. So I have my own virtual health coaching business for high-performing men. And we do virtual consults, reviewing blood work, genetic testing, as uh, you were alluding to earlier about the world of genomics and what's possible for customizing. So this is a naturopathic doctor. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so she actually graduated top of her class. And she helped me understand everything that was going on inside of my body. We got advanced blood work, advanced genetic testing. Uh, I realized I had a mutation for my ability to uh, synthesize vitamin D. So I was living in Iowa in the winter. Mind you, this was February. This is February in Iowa in the winter. So this was another excuse to move to California to get sunlight for my vitamin D receptor mutation. So I couldn't synthesize vitamin D that, that well. Uh, and so I'm learning all these things about myself. And it's, it spawned a few more chapters in the book. And I'm incredibly grateful for the experience. There's me over on the right. Not everyone smiles when they're getting blood work. But I was celebrating the fact that I was finally going to get clear answers as to why this episode just happened to me and how I can learn from it to prevent it from happening in the future and optimize my system in the present. And that's what I did. So uh, today, now we are going to dive into what I have found to be seven of the most high leverage health hacks someone could integrate into their lifestyle to notice the biggest impact when it comes to less stress, 
more energy uh, integrated into your lifestyle. So that's what we're going to focus on now. This is what I call the what. We're also going to be getting into the how and the why here in a little bit. So the what. Habit number one. Build a smart evening routine. An evening sleep routine. How many people uh, realize the benefits of, of sleep? We all, we all realize that that's important, right? Um, it's, where, it's where we recover. It's where we detox. And it's where we heal. It's a really important area to focus on. So many people sometimes can get caught up in the nutrition and the movement, which are both super important, uh, especially nutrition. I, I have another mentor who would always say to me, nutrition is to exercise as Batman is to Robin. Nutrition is the exercise, as Batman is to Robin. And I feel like sleep is like a, a whole new mythological comic book character that we can put in to take over for Batman. Sleep is that important. So what are the top hacks to improve our sleep? These are the top six sleep hacks that I would suggest. There's more than this. But number one, darken the room, the bedroom you're sleeping in, with blackout shades. Does anyone use blackout shades at home already? A few hands. Awesome. Yep. So, and even if you're, you've got the blackout shades, any other light exposure in the room, like, you know, at hotels, when the lights, the computer, yeah, the TV, the computer monitor, the, uh, it can be anything, right? Uh, uh, maybe the t TV will have a little light there. And like when I'm in a hotel, I'll bring duct tape and duct tape these lights. Like I'm that focused on optimizing the lighting environment for me on sleep because that has a big impact on our sleep. Number two, create a sleep sanctuary. Candles, a great source of light, uh, similar to fire. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the next one, uh, um, blue blockers here in, in a second, but it goes in handle, uh, hand in hand with candles. But music, find your favorite music. Do you have relaxing music that you go to? Uh, if not, I, I'm hap happily share my favorite artist to, to consider uh, to add your evening routine. Number three, turn Wi-Fi off at night. Kind of a crazy idea to think like, oh, could Wi-Fi be harmful? Like, well, we really don't know. It's only been a couple decades since we've had it. And how long have humans been around? So Wi-Fi and these other kind of hidden electromagnetic frequency stressors, EMFs as they're called, they're hidden. You can't see them. And sometimes when you have challenges and, and it's a mystery in your health and you're unsure, unsure what to focus on, this is one a lot of people miss out on. So consider trying to just simply unplug the Wi-Fi when you sleep. Who needs Wi-Fi on while you sleep, you know? Uh, so try that one out. Next, using blue blocker glasses. So the glasses I'm wearing here uh, block out a little bit of the blue light. Not much. They're known for, to be worn during the day and the prescription. They're my favorite blue blocker company. It's called Raw Optics. Has anyone worn blue blockers or heard of blue blockers before? Cool. I see some heads nodding. So... Uh, this is what the blue blockers look like that block out all the blue lights. They're orange. And they even have red ones that you wear right before bed that will knock you out. Why are these valuable? So the biggest issue with blue light when it comes to sleep specifically is that blue light disrupts melatonin production in the brain. Melatonin is our key sleep hormone. And if we don't have enough of it, we're not going to sleep as well. And so that mixed with evolution, evolutionarily, like if you look at our ancestors, our exposure for light, we never had this sort of artificial blue light in our world. W what are the light sources we, we had, you know, ancestrally? Raise your hand. Someone, someone throw those out. The sun and the moon. The sun and the moon and fire. 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 Exactly. So we're naturally programmed to operate best <coughs> off of that. Or another way of putting it is we haven't adapted or we're trying to adapt to this new world with all this artificial blue light, and we're scratching our head. Why is our health not getting better? Why am I not able to sleep as well? And when we're on the TV or our laptops or our phones at night, could the light from these screens be disrupting? And the answer is yes. There's plenty of PubMed studies out there on the value of these blue blockers. So I'm going to pass these around so you can try these out. Uh, throughout the talk here. And I'll put these back on so I can see you all and make eye contact and connect because those aren't prescription. Uh, so, so this speaks to something called the circadian rhythm, which I'm going to get into later, OK? But the next thing is set an optimal temperature. Colder is typically better. Uh, and um, so the last one, avoid certain drinks uh, and foods before 
bed. You don't want to eat too much before bed. Something I'll talk about a little later is the power of tracking. I mentioned the power of tracking your health, right? This ring on my finger, not married yet, this ring's doing something else. This is measuring all of my sleep, movement, and stress data. This is called the aura ring. I'll get into this a little bit later, but I'm able to correlate my behavior change with the data on the aura ring to see how changes in my lifestyle and my environment impact my performance and my data. And so I'm able to correlate all of these different areas to tell a full story of what's going on. So that, for instance, avoiding certain foods before bed, when I eat too close to bed or eat the wrong foods, I'm getting less uh, deep sleep. My resting heart rate doesn't get low enough. And if you want to hack your sleep, focusing on getting a lower resting heart rate while you sleep is very important for recovery. So uh, one hack, though, for the food to have before bed that can help is a little bit of honey, actually. So the brain requires a little glucose while it sleeps. And one of my favorite cocktails is hot water with a little apple cider vinegar and honey in there. And you mix it up before bed. Helps the digestive system. I see a nod back here. Are you agreeing with the honey? Do you like that? Yeah. Sweet. So habit number two, journal about your habits and lifestyle. Write things down. Not just on a computer or technology device, but actually a journal it has a whole nother impact on the experience. Habit number three, eat more healthy fats and less bad fats. Okay? Eat more healthy fats and less bad fats. How many have woken up or heard about recently about the power of eating and consuming good fats for value of health? Right? I mean, we're in a place here that has, is, is huge on that and sell amazing products to support you with a great omega-3s, a great heart health in, in their supplements here at Healthy for Life. This is a list of examples of fats to focus on and fats to avoid. All right? So, um, and you feel free to read through these, um, but fats to focus on, we got uh, single origin olive oil, meaning it only came from one place as opposed to multiple places, and they just put it all together. Uh, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, so butter from grass-fed cows as opposed to grain-fed. When they're grass-fed, they have a higher omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, which is better for heart health. Uh, and avocado oil, one of my favorites. So there's a, there's, a, there's a few core oils to use for high heat temperature, right? And uh, some people might uh, make some mistakes here and, and not use the right oils. This is one of the best ones to use, avocado oil, for high heat um, because it doesn't denature. And uh, it is a monounsaturated fat. It's not a sat saturated fat. And so if you want to do your genetic testing, you know, saturated fat can be helpful, but it can also increase LDL if you have a particular genetic mutation, which I might talk about in a little bit. All right, so avocado oil, avocados, wild salmon and sardines and oysters. Uh, sardines and oysters are some of the best fish because they're the highest in omega-3, but the lowest in mercury toxin toxicity because they're the smallest. Okay, uh, pasture-raised eggs, grass-fed animals, nuts and seeds, and olives. These are all things that the Healthy for Life University curriculum will share with you as well, right? That all of this is right in line. And then fats and foods to avoid canola oil, even if it's organic or non-GMO. Other vegetable oils, any hydrogenated oil, gluten, peanuts, high GI carbohydrates. Uh, a quick note on olive oil. So olive oil is an amazing oil. And uh, it's, it's great specifically at helping to boost HDL. It's actually one of the only like, tools and, and ways to help boost HDL. That and exercise uh, have been proven to boost HDL. But some people use that for high heat cooking, but it, and it actually denatures. So if you use olive oil, high heat, heat cooking, consider butter, coconut oil, or avocado oil. Your heart will thank you later. Uh, and better yet, add the omega-3s that Healthy for Life has, and the heart will thank you even more. Habit number four, intermittent fasting and, uh, and or an eight-hour eating window. Any, raise your hand here if anyone's ever experimented with intermittent fasting. Awesome. I see a few hands. Sweet. And what's your experience been of intermittent fasting? Anyone care to share? Shaking his head. Doesn't work for me. Doesn't work for you. Yeah. Yep. What does that mean, though? What does that mean it doesn't work? It just it doesn't. I mean, I eat very clean, but my body just doesn't couldn't take in the intermittent fasting. Yeah, so everyone's different. So here's the definition of intermittent fasting for context. So at hours 12 through 14, our bodies shift from burning calories to burning stored fat. So when you get, so think of sleep. Let's say you eat dinner at 
8 p.m. or 7 p.m. and you sleep, you wake up the next morning, 7 a.m., that's a 12-hour fasting window, right? And once you get up to 14 on up is when you really start to burn more of your own body fat. So that's, that's actually how it works. And so um, it can be challenging. The, the, you want to do it the right way, and, and it's important to, uh, you know, test out different experiences with it, maybe even measure your blood glucose, measure your ketone levels. Um, but that's how fasting works. And so, uh, you know, we've been programming our world to always eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, have all of these meals. When ancestrally, if you look at it, we really, <laughs> we evolved to become quite efficient at using our own body fat for energy. We never really knew when our next meal would be. And there are plenty of studies and benefits out now about the role of intermittent fasting. I, again, I, I would say consult your doctor, have your own N equals one plan in place to try this out, but it can be a great way to start to burn your own body fat, lower blood glucose, lower your insulin, and um, not be as dependent on food for energy. Uh, we, we get energy not just from food, but we get energy uh, from the sun, you know, and that's why one of the next things we're going to talk about here today, we're going to talk more about sunlight. Uh, next habit, habit number five is passive sweating with sauna or steam room two to three times per week or as needed. It's one of my favorite ones. We own our own sauna in our place, an infrared sauna from Sauna Space. So Sauna Space is, is the name of a company that uh, makes an infrared sauna with four 250-watt bulbs and it's this little canvas pop-up tent. All right, so why, why is passive sweating good for us? Uh, we've been doing it for ages now uh, throughout several different cultures in our world have been using sauna. Um, and the, one of the core things that's happening when you're using sauna, passive sweating, allows you to go from a sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response, to a parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. This is when our bodies fully able to relax, recover, heal, and detox. It's one of the best ways to heal and detox is passive sweating. And the thing about an infrared sauna compared to a regular dry sauna, has anyone been in a dry sauna and feel like they can't breathe, it's just so hot in there sometimes? Why is that? That's because it heats you up. A dry sauna heats you up from the outside in. But an infrared sauna heats you up from the inside out. So you can actually breathe in the room. The infrared light is penetrating into your tissues and warming you up from the inside out. Fascinating, right, how that works? And you can actually breathe in an infrared sauna. So lots of studies out now about the power of infrared sauna, um, but this is uh, a really high leverage one to consider. Habit six, as I mentioned earlier, blocking the artificial blue light and getting quality sunlight. As I mentioned, this thing called the circadian rhythm. Think of this as our internal body clock, right? And we wake up with the sun and we sleep with the sun with the sun as it goes down, or at least we ought to. Um, that is typically a great way to look at, like living your life in tune with the sun, waking up with it and going to bed with it, um, but it's different throughout the day. So the sun actually changes its, its what it emits throughout the day. It's really fascinating. So I just interviewed a life therapy expert, a sun expert on my podcast. That'll come out in a few weeks. Um, and uh, what happens is in the morning, when the sun is rising. Have you ever noticed it's like easier to look at the sun when it's rising compared to the middle of the day or easier to look at a sunset when it's setting towards the end of the day? Why do you think that is? You know, <laughs> that's because you're receiving full spectrum. You're receiving all of the light. All of the, so imagine a rainbow. Why do you see all these colors from a rainbow? Those colors are actually naturally present. You just can't see them. But when you have light and water, do their thing and you create this magical thing called a rainbow, those spectrums or light are available in the sun and they change throughout the day. But in the morning specifically, when you're able to receive that, like no glasses on, if you're a guy, take your shirt off, getting as much sun exposure first thing in the morning is one of the best ways to support your, your energy, your hormones, uh, and it's, it's a great way to help, help you sleep actually. When, if you get morning sunlight, you'll sleep better. It's, it, crazy thing, but it, it's true. It works. Try it out yourself. Um, and then sunset. So what happens is red light is one of the slowest forms of light. It's also a very healing form of light. So in the spectrum of the rainbow, you got the blue, the green, the yellow, and, and you, also have, uh, you also have red. 
and red is one of the slowest. And so that's why at sunrise, you're able to actually look at the sun. Like people have done their own like, like uh, experiments to like stare directly into the sun. Uh, and you, you can get away with it or, or stare around it. And you can notice this orb and it turns red. You can actually see the red. Try it out. It's really freaky, but it's, it's powerful. So anyone uh, uh, interested in, in hacking the relationship with the sun, that's a quick tip. Uh, there is an app I would recommend called the D-Minder app. If you want to write that down, that's a great way to measure how much vitamin D is out there for us to receive, which typically comes in the afternoon. Okay, so and during the middle of the day is your highest chances of getting vitamin D production. All right, so habit number seven, co-create in the kitchens with your loved ones. Uh, if you're interested in making progress in your nutrition, have fun with it. Eating based off of pleasure and performance. Those are our tenants that we live with. Uh, and it's a great way to build in accountability. The more accountability you can stack into your lifestyle for these areas, the more successful you can be. So those are the top seven habits in review. I'd love to hear which of these seven really resonate with you guys the most or, or piques your interest or something to explore, or experiment with in your lifestyle. What comes up for you guys? Any, any of these really stick out for you? Yeah. Good question. Yeah, they just, uh, the company recently upgraded their bulbs. They're now manufacturing their own 250 watt incandescent near infrared bulbs. And so they're stronger. They're three to five times stronger. So I was in there for 45 minutes, but now I'm only doing like 25, 30 minutes for these sessions. Yeah. And you rotate throughout. There's a little stool in there and you rotate and you get the light all throughout your body. Yeah. Good question. Any of these interest people or uh, feel called to focus on or the thoughts on these? The what? Really what is? Uh, the light. The light. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. How about not just sweating? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I didn't mention that for a distinction. Yeah, when you're working out and when you're sweating through working out, yes, there's his own sets of uh, benefits of doing such, right? But what happens is when you're, when you're sweating through working out, your nervous system is not in the rest and digest state. You're in the fight or flight response. So uh, it's valuable, don't get me wrong, and you can't truly relax while you're working out in terms of tapping into that rest and digest relaxation state. So does that make sense to people when, when you think about it, right? When you're active, actively sweating, so, so you're not able to cue up the nervous system to really do its powerful healing. That's the power of the nervous system. It's really, really fascinating. Anyone else feel called to do you share? Mean, uh, do you mean sweating before or after you <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Uh, I love, we love, uh, I love getting in before I eat. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it'll help get me into my body if I'm intermittent fasting in the morning and, and get in the sauna and, um, yeah, but you can do it at any times of the day. So red light has the least impact on melatonin. So I mentioned earlier, blue light has a really big impact. So if you wanted to consider lighting up your homes at night with a light uh, besides blue light, you can invest in an infrared bulb, a, a red light bulb, uh, and you'll have a better, you'll have more melatonin to help you sleep. Yeah. Yeah, so those are the seven. Th those are, that's the what. Okay, so now we're going to get more interactive. All right. I'm going to pass around this handout here. We're going to get into a self-coaching questionnaire in a second. But first, we're going to have everyone score uh, themselves on, a, on a, uh, a score of one to five. And if you need a pen, I have them here. Where they fall for each of these five Ps. So these are the five Ps of health hacking, the five principles, the central tenets to create clarity on and to support you in your health hacking journey. So number one is prevention. How well do you focus on prevention in your lifestyle when it comes to your health and your decisions? Number two is performance. How well do you think about and make the connection between how your health impacts your performance in life? Number three is progress. How well are you celebrating progress in your lifestyle? as opposed to, say, perfection. And number four, preparation. How well are you preparing throughout your day with your health in mind? 
Are you creating opportunities for cues to remind you to go on walks during the day or to remind you to put down technology at night before you sleep and maybe read a book? There's, uh, so how well are you preparing in your life for your health? Next is presence. Last but certainly not least is presence. So how well are you living in the now, living in the present moment and cultivating present moment awareness? These five Ps, go ahead and score yourself on a, score, on a, a, a range of one to five with five being the best. On all five. On all five of them. Yep. I have pens, yeah. So who needs pens? Pens, 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 pens. Pens, pens. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead and take uh, about 30 more seconds here or less. Who's got those blue boxes? Okay, has anyone, have everyone had a chance to go through this and score themselves? So, so why, why, why do you think there's value in scoring yourself on, on these areas that affect our health? Why is it value to kind of, why is it important to kind of like check in with ourselves and, and give ourselves a score? Helps you take ownership of your own body. Helps you take ownership of your own body, yep, yep. So, exactly, and, and what it allows is, is for you to see maybe where you're doing well, where are those fours and fives at, and where are those ones, twos, and threes. And if you can get clear on what you're doing well at and what you could work on, then you can use the momentum that you have of what's going well to help fuel the areas that you want to make progress in, which we're going to get into next in this, this worksheet you have right now. But this, is, this exercise of reflecting on these five Ps is something I do with myself and my clients on a monthly, quarterly basis, ongoing. This is something for you to cultivate your own self-reflection experience. All right, now we're going to get into one of my favorite exercises. It's the self-coaching exercise. So this is the why. I specialize in the how, the what, how, why, when, where of healthy habit creation. Now we're getting into the why. So this is a step to uncover your desires and your interests and follow this conversation flow model with yourself. I mentioned I'm a clinical health coach. I actually went through a training locally here in Des Moines called the Clinical Health Coach. Has anyone heard of this training? So we trained health professionals on how they communicate with patients to help them adopt behavior change, to really transform the conversation. And there is one of the most evidence-backed forms of communication to inspire effective behavior change. It's called motivational interviewing. Has anyone heard of this before? So motivational interviewing is a really effective way to follow a conversation flow model with the patients. Health coaches use it very effectively. And so what I did in this exercise and in my book is democratize that conversation flow model to the average person to use with themselves. So we've got s different stages of this conversation intended to be done in sequence, starting with the engaging questions. The first question on your piece of paper is what? What is going well for you in your health right now? Go ahead and spend 30 seconds reflecting on this question. What is going well for you in your health right now? It can be anything as small or big as you might see. It's up to you. Next question is, what are some areas of your health you've been exploring of late or that you're interested in exploring that are on your mind? What are you most interested in working on or exploring? And why are those areas important to you? So step one, we affirm ourselves and celebrate what's already going well, where most people go straight to, what am I not doing? Focusing on what's going well at the beginning helps to fuel 
and your motivation for progress and habit change. So we start with that and then we ask, what are we interested in and why? Why are we interested in those? Getting clear on that. And I'd encourage you, yes, we can do some reflection on this tonight, but also beyond tonight, continue to do your own work following this flow model with yourself and then share with others. So number three is why is now a good time for you to start taking action in these areas of your health? Why now as opposed to some point in the future? Those are the three questions on that worksheet. And there's a few more up here as well that you, if you want, if you want to be an overachiever and explore these as well, um, we've got an evoking change talk. So there's a concept I teach on in the book called the five stages of change. Okay, has anyone heard of this before? This is the trans theoretical model of behavior change. These five stages of change that we can actually see where we fall in the stages of change with certain habits. And when you evoke change talk by certain questions and cues to help prompt someone to explore where they fall and their levels of, of importance and confidence. The two key areas when it comes to behavior change to explore is how important something is to you and how confident you are in your ability to achieve it. So this question, if you want to ask yourself on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the highest, how important is it for you to try out this new habit or behavior? And then how confident, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, how confident are you about moving forward with this new habit or behavior? Okay, so now that we have covered this exercise, who wants to share maybe what came up for them as they went through the three questions on their worksheet? Um, uh, any, any realizations or ideas that came up? Uh, I would love to hear who, who feels called to volunteer and, and share. Uh, was this a value for people to reflect on in their lifestyle? Yeah, I can share one. Yeah. Right. And you alluded to that, the reason why Michael Brown was so important to you. Exactly. Right. When we're living in the past, when we're living in emotions that keep occurring over and over and over again, and we go, wow, there's something going on there. So emotional health has been huge. Mm. How important is that? It impacts every part of my life. My relationships, my children, my grandchild, anything like that. So what number on importance? Ten. Ten. And what about confidence? One. How confident are you? On scale of one. Increasing okay. So so sweet, sweet. Twice. So what? Awesome, amazing, amazing. This, yeah. by the way, he's talking about a book that I reference in my book, had a profound impact on my life, called the Presence Process. Michael Brown is the author, and it's a ten-week meditation breathing exercise, is what he calls them. Two, doing two 15-minute breathing exercises a day, first thing in the morning and first thing at night, uh, and it really. Uh, brings up, can bring up a lot, but really help you to live more in the moment. So how confident are you in the emotional health area? What number? Seven. Seven. Love it. So why are you a seven and not a three? Because we've been practicing. You've been practicing. Yeah. You've put in some time in. The second ten years. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So do you see what I did there? I reflected. I asked the question, like, where do you fall? And why are you at that number and not the lower number? And when you ask the question that way, you affirm someone for being at the level they're at as opposed to being at a lower level. And that helps to build their confidence and build their motivation. These might seem simple language hacks, but they can be very, very powerful to really help you create clarity and confidence in your approach. So I appreciate you sharing. Anyone else feel called to share what came up for them in this Self-coaching exercise. Don't all go at once. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm comfortable with, with quiet, you know, uncomfortable moments. So I'll, I'll wait, if, if, see if anyone has anything they feel called to, to share about, um, you know. Or rather, would you rather turn to your partner and maybe share with them? So this next exercise we're going to do 
takes it to a whole nother level. That was the why, this is the how. You have a cross on your piece of paper, all right? This is the four quadrant model for sustainable behavior change. On the top left, I want you to label that box, stop doing. And the top right, label the box, start doing. Bottom left, label do more of. And bottom right, label do less of. For me in the health and the fitness and the nutrition world, as I mentioned earlier, it can, get, it can be easy to get caught up in perfection mindset, you know, the whole black or white. I'm either all in or I'm all out. And what this exercise allows for you to do is to leverage the gray areas. Yes, the black and white of what do I need to stop doing, what do I need to start doing, but the gray areas of life that you might not want to completely stop or completely uh, start, you, maybe you've already started it and you want to do more of it, or maybe you are currently doing it but you want to do less of it. I, I imagine you can think to yourself, what are some areas that come up for you? This is a chance for you to operationalize everything you've just done. The self-coaching questions we just went through, what's going well for you, what are you interested in, why? That flow model feeds this four-quadrant model for optimal health behavior change. So ask yourself, journal, Write at least one to two items in each of these boxes. What do you want to stop doing in your life right now that's of extreme value for you? It's been on your mind maybe for a little bit, but you want to stop doing. Next, what do you want to start doing that's been on your mind? You've thought about it. You just haven't done it yet. Bottom left, do more of. What are the things you're already doing that you want to do more of, and what do you want to do less of? So take a couple minutes to explore these four boxes and this is the how, how we put it into action. Spend one more minute here. So if there's a box you haven't worked on yet, um, maybe finish up the one you're on and move on to that other box. Go ahead and start to wrap it up, and we'll come back to the room here. And um, I'm going to ask you and invite you to turn to a partner and share with them what came up for you in these four boxes. So you don't need to share with me. You can share with the partner. So go ahead and spend a couple minutes sharing with your partner what came up for you on this four-quadrant model and, uh, and practice your listening skills. That's all I'll say. <laughs> so go ahead and start sharing a little bit.
If you haven't switched already, switch to the other person to share. We'll spend one more minute. Do I have it? Why? Does that seem like it? Sure. And start to wrap it up the next 10 seconds. All right, let's all come back together here. So awesome. So, um, how we, wh what was that like? Just talk with your partner about it, right? So, you just went through this exercise on your own, you did your own reflection, you wrote down some ideas for each of these boxes. And then you talk to someone about it. Uh, anyone feel called to share about what came up for them and sharing with their partner? If not, we can go on. People don't need to share, but I mean, you know, I'm curious if this was a value and, and what it was like for people. Yeah, I think when you um, talk about it, it almost, you're making a declaration. So it's not kind of like, oh, I said it a year later, but it's kind of, well, I kind of said this. There's a little bit of accountability. So you felt by sharing your intention around these areas to focus on that it was like adding more another layer of accountability to, to your experience uh, so that you would actually walk it out. Yeah, absolutely. It cemented a little more. Mm, cool. And what's that like to have that cemented in a little bit more? Um, higher likelihood of doing it. Yeah, cool. Sweet. Yeah, you, that's coaching yourself up the level through the stages of change. Yeah, anyone, uh, could, and can anyone else relate to that? How sharing helped to like almost cement it in a little bit, like what you, because you're sharing what you want to do with someone that you might have just met or that you already trust and have lived with for years, <laughs> depending on who your partner was. Uh, anyone else feel called to share about specific areas or, or was there one area in particular that, you know, let's start with maybe, let's see, did, let's go with do less <coughs> of. Let's, uh, who had some, 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 um, some good areas of their lifestyle to explore in this box? the things they want to do less of, or they do more of? Phone. Phone. <laughs> Under which one? Do less of. <laughs> cool. Thanks for sharing, man. Yeah, so just like total time on the phone, or like certain times of the day, do less of it. Yeah. Both. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Can anyone else relate to that? The whole phone thing. Yeah, they, they, they are uh, and can be addictive and you don't have to do as me but just to give you an idea I felt I was so addicted that um, do you guys recognize these? <laughs> yeah, right? This is not a burner phone. This is, this is my legit phone. <laughs> you know I'm, used, I'm going back to use technology tools in their original state. I'm like three months in. Uh, I'm three months into using this flip phone. I sold my iPhone because I was distracted and addicted to the app world. You know and, and uh, I wanted a phone to make phone calls, you know, what its, what its purpose is. And I can pretty much, I'll, you can learn from me, but if, if you're interested in trying this out, the only things you'll miss the most are uh, if you send money to people on your phone, Venmo, you can't send money on Venmo on your laptop, <laughs> the desktop version. Uh, GPS is something I miss a little bit, you know, back in the day, do you remember printing off MapQuest directions? Anyone remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, now I'm l actually learning my geography on my own and not outsourcing it to AI. And there's a few others. But you mean, do you remember real maps? Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever been exactly. To maps? No comment. But <laughs> anyways, and I'm saving my, it's 30 bucks a month, you know, and so that's my flip phone story, and I'm sticking to it right now. Um, so cool. I, I appreciate you guys sharing. Uh, so people resonated with the phone thing. That's cool. And there's some apps that can help you track your time on a lot of those things as well. There's something called the Freedom app. Uh, it's funny how we need more apps to help us spend less time on other apps. 
what world are we living in here? All right, so that's the four-quarter model of change. Was this valuable? Can you guys see yourself doing this with, and sharing this with friends or family on a quarterly basis? So what this does is you can operationalize this. You can make and turn one or two areas, maybe just focus on one in each of those boxes. If you turn it into an action item, I'll share in a little bit how you can actually track that on your own over time to actually measure your progress and to walk out what you say you want to do. How does that sound? Scary because it's more accountability, right? <laughs> but you are in control. You're the coach of yourself in this instance, not someone else. So these are the quick mistakes I'll go over. Uh, number one was me trying keto and bulletproof coffee all on my own without fully customizing. I'm healthy enough. Sounds cool, but I'm, I don't need the help with my health, building that team, asking for help. So I'm, I'm healthy enough. That's number one. Uh, some people will have. Number two is it's too hard. I think I could make big strides in my health, but it's too hard to give up my favorite foods and drinks or phone blank. It, you name it, whatever it is. You insert whatever that one is, giving things up. Uh, and number three, I don't have the time. I'm sold on health hacking, but with work and family responsibilities, I don't have the time right now to focus on my health. Does any, do, do either of these resonate with people? Any of these three or one more than the other? Some nods there. Um, cool. So there's, there's a few hacks for these. These are the hacks. So these are the secrets. If you want to avoid the first mistake, I'm healthy enough, I don't need to ask for help. Um, so here's the secret number one. If you want optimization, it starts with customization. How to build your own all-star healthcare team to support you in creating a customized nutrition and supplement movement and overall lifestyle game plan that works with you and your goals and your lifestyle. If you want optimization, it starts with customization. <laughs> secret number two, the time thing, and it's, it's hard, this challenge. Secret number two is understanding the formula to focus on progress not perfection. So at the bottom of this form that you guys all just went through, the self-coaching exercise, if you're interested in receiving these slides as well as some of my other tools, which this health hacker formula is a three-step process for optimal health behavior change that I can share with you. If you're interested in receiving these slides or this formula, uh, simply just text your name and email and the words health hacker to my phone number, to my flip phone, yes. I'll receive a bunch of text messages on my flip phone. Uh, and I'll follow up via email and send that to you. Okay? And so, uh, and really, uh, secret number two is all about um, the principle of cycling, focusing on progress, not perfection. For instance, uh, I enjoy a, a, a cocktail every now and then. Alcohol can be something that can be a, a healthy habit if done properly, but it's also something to consider cycling off of every now and then. So I actually spent four months of this year cycling off of alcohol. And then I celebrated and might have had a drink to celebrate. Now, I, I, I feel like I have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Sometimes our livers, which are responsible for healing and detoxification, uh, can ne need a break from alcohol. So that's an example of cycling off of something that you might really enjoy. Uh, and you don't want to give it up completely, like do less of it. Um, so those, and then secret number three is stacking your hacks. It's one of my favorite ones. Stack your hacks to create the state you desire on command in the moment. Okay, so how to sneak short and simple health hacks into your day to create better energy, more focus, and actually add more productive quality work time to your day. Right, and that's what we're going to be exploring next here in a little bit. But first, so the question of where does health happen? This is a quote from the founder of the clinical health coach training I mentioned earlier, a local Iowa mentor of mine, Dr. Bill Applegate. Health happens in our bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens, and not the four walls of the doctor's office. Now, that's nothing against doctors, but when you go to a doctor's office, you're checking in on your health, but health actually happens outside of the office where you live your life, in your bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens. When I first heard that quote from him, uh, it really resonated with me, and, and so I wanted to share that with you guys tonight. So what is habit stacking? Secret number three. This is the practice of combining certain small health behaviors and or environmental changes together within a short amount of time to help the brain and body create a specific state or feeling you desire on command. So, for example, the state of relaxation. Let's say you're wanting to relax or calm down before sleep. 
by stacking the use of relaxing music with a warm Epsom salt bath and maybe drinking lavender tea, you're able to deepen your ability to relax before bed. Multiple different hacks, all designed to help you create that specific state you desire in the moment. We all go through stressful times, right? And so to get out of stressful times, we need to stack the deck in our favor so that we can actually like, have the freedom to work through our stress. And this is just one example of the state of relaxation. You can do the same thing for the state of energy or focus or calm. And you can stack your hacks on top of each other. Uh, and this is my, my, one of my favorite uh, tools for clients to really support them with. Because time is of the essence right, in our life. And, and it's a very uh, important freedom. So question. Yeah, music I, that I like. So, does anyone listen to Spotify here? Okay, cool. So, uh, she's got her phone out. Yeah, so Spotify, which I don't only use on my desktop. I don't have that app on my phone anymore. But Spotify has an amazing playlist from an artist called Moby. So, Moby, M-O-B-Y. I actually met him at a Wanderlust event in, in Colorado uh, a few years back. Moby uh, is an amazing artist with non-lyrical music. So yes, you can get relaxing music from lyrical music, but tapping into non-lyrical music, I have a whole chapter in the book towards the end about music and how you can use that as a health hack. So Moby, the playlist is LA, LA, capitalized, which stands for long ambience. Specifically, LA number one song and LA number nine. I know, right? Really specific, but these are like, these are state changing songs that allow you to get into your breath, get into your body, and create that healing parasympathetic nervous system state. Uh, so, great question. That's one artist. So is LA the CD? L it's the name of the album. If you look up on Spotify, Spotify, LA1 or LA9, Moby, it'll pop up. Um, uh, yeah, another one called Youthing, <laughs> uh, Youthing, some anti-aging music, <laughs> kind of crazy, right? Uh, on YouTube, look up Youthing. Uh, we'll use that during our sauna sessions. Uh, yeah, those are those are some examples. But otherwise, ask yourself, you know, what are some relaxing music you enjoy? Uh, uh, but one of the uh, one of the, there's actually um, yeah. So I'd encourage you to really check out that last chapter. I get into a lot more on the music hacks in the last chapter. So thoughts on habit stacking. Does this seem interesting about like how you can like sort of really stack the deck in your favor to help you be successful? So this is an example of how the tracking works. So I've taught you the stacking, we've gone over all the hacking, now we're getting into the tracking. I mentioned I'm kind of going back to using technology tools in the original state. I'm also in general trying to spend less time on technology when it comes to things that I want to improve on in my life. The power of handwriting, your goals, and going analog for this example is really an unmissed, it's an untapped opportunity for people. So over on the right, this is an example of what my actual seven day health hacker challenge looks like. I set up my own kind of weekly sprints. All right, I call it the seven day health hacker challenge. Cool, so vertically you've got the day of the week, Monday through Sunday, and horizontally you've got the areas of your habits you wanna focus on. So you use the self coaching exercise you all just went through, right? Determine what's in your box, the four quadrant model, to find those four behaviors that you wanna focus on. And then you add those behaviors in the horizontal axis at the top. So here are mine, mine here are no alcohol, NA, med for meditate, daily fast of like a 14 to 20 hour fast because my body does well with intermittent fasting. No food past 8 p.m. because that's a big impact on my sleep. AM sunlight and total sleep, no tech past 10. Now that's like seven or eight of them. You can start with just three or four and all you do is put an X in the box if you completed that habit and an O in the box if you didn't. The purpose is not to be perfect. The purpose is to simply track and measure because you cannot manage what you do not measure. I think there's a famous president who I quoted in my book who said I had a quote along those lines. You cannot manage and or optimize what you do not measure. And this is the simplest, easiest way to measure and the hacks that you want to track in your lifestyle. Analog, right? Piece of paper, whiteboard, 
doesn't matter. And what you do at the end of the week is to simply reflect on it and be like, oh, where did I have a bunch of X's and where did I have some O's? Oh, and you can cycle off of the habit that had all the X's and do some more reflection around where are those O's? Why wasn't I able to do that? That's what this process affords us. And this is an example of how my client looked at it. This is Ken Brown, a professor at the University of Iowa who I've been coaching for the last year and a half. This is his quote on the right and his actual his graph of, of his seven day challenge here. Simple analog chart for twice a day habit of nutritional supplements, breathing exercise, and movement of some kind. Three for three this morning. Didn't take as long as my goal here is just to make each of these three a habit. Meaning he's not focused on being perfect so it doesn't take as long. He's looking to 80-20 each of them and to ultimately build them as a habit. And so stacking, when you, when you, and when you track multiple habits, if you track one and you do that one, a lot of times that will give you momentum to do the next one as well. And so that's what he realized in his journey is that it didn't take as long and it was a lot easier. My challenge so far in the accelerator, he goes on to say, has been stacking. I'm so busy I can only seem to focus on one thing at a time and I have felt at times overwhelmed. This gives me a simple way to set a stacking tool, uh, a stacking goal. Great tip. So that's an example of a client that, who used that. And this is actually him at the top of uh, Kilimanjaro. Uh, he climbed and was able to, to summit uh, just a few months back. And I'm really happy for him, working with him, to help him literally elevate his state. That's the name of my podcast, Elevate Your State. And he was literally doing that in the mountains. Um, so. Without further ado, to close, I'm going to get into and share the recipes in a second, if you stay till the end, and then this one. This is where I'll take some questions on it, um, but these are my top 20 health hacks for energy and high performance for people to consider. All right, and I'll just breeze through them, and if you have questions, raise your hand. Number one, full spectrum sunlight, AM and PM, which I mentioned earlier. Number two, go on walks outside. You know, a great way to get movement in, get nature time in, and get a break from technology is to simply put one foot in front of the other outside in nature while also getting light. So that's number two. Number three, build meaningful relationships. So there's a reason I had you share the habits you want to focus on in your life with your partner is that we can do this self-coaching, yes, and that can go a long way, but the power of buddy coaching to own your desire for change with other people helps to instill this change. Number four, breathe with intention. Right? So breathing is one of the interesting phenomenons of our body that uh, we naturally do on our own uh, without thinking about it. And we can actually think about it intentionally. So it's both autonomic and automatic. And we can, we can, but we don't always remember how to breathe. And so focusing on our breath allows for more presence in the body. Uh, hot cold therapy, also known as contrast therapy. Okay, hot cold therapy I mentioned earlier to you guys up here. Great way to increase circulation and blood flow throughout the body. I actually will credit this to my father up here <laughs> when he would go from hot to cold showers and make noise. We all, you know, sometimes we can, we can do that in the shower, but there's benefits to that. Why do we, why do, we do that naturally? Because it feels good and, and it allows blood to flow. And uh, both hot and cold therapy have their own benefits of which I get into inside of the book. Uh, for instance, would you believe that it's actually better to take a warm shower at night to cool down your body temperature as opposed to a cold shower? Why is that? Because when we are in our home, we're in our and when we warm ourselves up, our body always wants to find that homeostasis body temperature. So when you warm yourself up, your body's going to cool off on the inside to find that happy medium. That's why in the morning, the best way to wake up is usually with a cold shower. Dad, thank you for teaching me this growing up. Because the cold water will actually warm us up inside. And to wake, we want to actually warm our bodies up. So simple, uh, yet really interesting hacks here. So next, drinking spring water and getting a shower filter. Um, uh, yes, so um, if you have questions on that, feel free to ask me. But you can actually test the before and after of what's in your water with shower filters. Uh, any filter on your water system. Intermittent fasting, as we mentioned earlier. Eating seasonably and locally, uh, which Healthy for Life is a huge supporter of. Uh, sleep seven and a half hours minimum on average. Here's the thing with sleep. We have these things called uh, 
uh, circadian rhythms, right? And, and while we're sleeping, we have sleep cycles. The average sleep cycle, most people's sleep, cy sleep cycles are 90 minutes long, okay? So an hour and a half. So people think, oh, eight hours is the best way to get the most sleep, or nine, or, or seven. Everyone has something different. But here's the thing. If you want to stack the deck in your favor and prevent waking up groggy in the morning, you wake up groggy when you're in, when you're in deep sleep, in that form of sleep. But if you wake up and set your alarm for a multiple of an hour and a half of sleep, so hour and a half multiple, which, which would be an hour and a half, that'd be one. Three hours is a multiple of hour and a half. Four and a half hours is a multiple of hour and a half. That's your third sleep cycle. Six hours is your fourth sleep cycle. And seven and a half hours is that fifth sleep cycle. What that does is, is it minimizes your chance of waking up in deep sleep and maximizes your chance of waking up in light sleep or REM. So you don't wake up as groggy. So that's a hack. All right? uh, so hour and a half sleep multiples for sleeping, blocking artificial blue light with things like blue blockers like I'm wearing now. Number 11, advanced blood work one to two times per year. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have a whole chapter on that uh, in the book, the genetic testing just once. You only need to do that once. Because uh, they're not going to change. What we can change is how we have how we operate in the world, which influences our genes. Stool and gut testing as needed. Full spectrum infrared sauna, as we talked earlier, a little bit. Uh, HRV training. This stands for heart rate variability. HRV is a topic I get into in the topic of, of stress in the book. HRV is uh, heart rate variability is a, a metric that, uh, as opposed to just studying uh, your heart rate, it looks at the variation and beats, and that's uh, being studied for uh, lots of PubMed studies out there about its impact on mortality rates. And you're able to increase your HRV level, which is known as increasing your coherence, which builds more emotional resilience. And one of the biggest things to help boost your HRV score for emotional resilience is heart-centered breathing. Intentional breathing through the stomach, into the heart, and out and really settling into the body. Another quick hack is something called alternate nostril breathing. I talk about in the book. I've studied this and watched my HRV score real time change when I used to have an app on my phone. <laughs> HeartMath is a great organization to look up that does HRV work. And alternate nostril breathing, inhaling up one and exhaling out the other and then inhaling up that one and then exhaling out the other. That's one of the best ways to boost HRV and to create that parasympathetic nervous system state. And uh, the last five here, take tech breaks, reconnect with nature, grounding or forest bathing. So there's a book called The Nature Fix, amazing read, which I highlight in the book about an author who used to live in Boulder, Colorado, where we're at. She moved to the city in Maryland and talked about that contrast and change there, but she's also a journalist. She studied the impact of nature they're actually quantifying this in Japan. They have labs set up outside of forests to see what forest bathing, people walking through the forest, how it impacts their blood pressure, their heart rate, and their heart rate variability. This is actually being studied. So using nature as a health hack. Eating healthy fats, salt first half of your day, so we dehydrate while we sleep. So rehydrating in the morning is very essential. Well, just minimize this. Yeah, I mean, imagine eating tons of salt right before bed, right? You're going to wake up a little bit more inflamed, naturally. You've got more salt in your system uh, than, um, than you might need at that, that point in time. Um, yeah, and then try, and oh, and a quick hack on that. So a lot of people sometimes might fear salt, right? And it's gotten demonized and like, oh, I can't have, I'm on a low salt diet because uh, I have uh, high blood pressure, right? And what the real science will share is that it's the quality of salt that makes the biggest difference. So as opposed to like table salt or like sea salt, uh, pink Himalayan salt. Um, and one of the hacks is to, to see if your body needs more salt is to simply sprinkle some on your hand, lick it, and if it, <coughs> if it tastes good and your body tells you that it, that it feels good and it tastes good, that usually a sign is that you need more. Your body's really wise and will communicate to you that way. I, as you learned earlier, learned that the hard way, <laughs> going to the ER for low sodium. Last but not least, try nootropic supplements. One of the bigger challenges for people when it comes to lifestyle change is energy, right? Having the energy and motivation to do these things. These are specific supplements 
that uh, can be great to give you mental focus and mental energy. Uh, and you know, a, a, a few of the ones that healthy for life cells can do the same as well. Those omegas that the brain and the heart really need can be great for uh, focus and longevity for the brain. So that's the overview of those top 20 health hacks. I got a book club, uh, a Facebook group if you want to check it out. But otherwise, uh, Q&A time, and then I'll share the recipes with you. But any questions on these top 20 hacks here that people are curious about? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I thought that was on here, but it's not. Um, I may have mentioned uh, the Aura Ring earlier. So it's a wearable uh, that I'm wearing right here. And it has an um, airplane mode feature that you can turn on while you're sleeping. So you're not disrupted with your sleep with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals. They have an app, yes, but you can also access your data on their dashboard on the desktop. So you don't have to use an app to access your data. This is a, one of the best wearables on the market. So here's the thing about wearables. You actually get better heart rate data on the finger, better quality, more accurate data than you do the wrist. And uh, so that combined with its airplane mode feature and its quality sleep data, it's, it's really fascinating. Just to give you an example, this is, um, <laughs> this is a portal where I track all, all of my health data. Think of it as a personal electronic medical record for the individual. It's called Heads Up Health. This is, you're looking at all my personal metrics right here. All right, so you got weight, body mass index, time of sleep right here. This is my Aura Ring sleep data from the other night, seven hours and 56 minutes. It wasn't quite at that seven and a half hour multiple. Uh, and you can see your awake time, your REM time, leap, uh, light, deep, um, steps, calories burned. So this is an example of, of how you can interface and get all of your data in one place, Heads Up Health. Um, an, an amazing data tracking platform that integrates with all the wearable data as well as medical records right here. So uh, blood tests and other medical records that you want to track on your own, you can upload to this. And they have an API with uh, all, of the, uh, all of the top uh, clinics and pharmacies and labs uh, across the country. So that's, that's just an example of... Um, of, uh, of that. Any other questions on these top 20 hacks up here? Yes? Where do you get the uh, blue blockers? Yeah. Do you like these? Did anyone else like these? Did it feel good to wear those? Yeah. Uh, and, and you can find these at rawoptics.com. Raw, R-A, <coughs> optics, O-P-T-I-C-S, Dot com. And uh, that's the podcast guest, actually, I just interviewed. Matt Maruka, a 20-year-old founder, um, created this company. And amazing blue blockers. I have a discount code. It's, I think, Health Hacker, if you want to save 10%. Um, great question. Rawoptics.com. Yes, if you want cheaper ones. So these are uh, 100 or more on the site. Um, if, you, if you want to go fancy and concerned about how you look, you, know, you can invest in those. You can also buy cheaper ones on Amazon. There's a brand called Uvex. They're like 10 bucks. You look like a construction worker. <laughs> You've seen them, Mom. Yeah, they're called Uvex, U-V-E-X. Uh, those are the orange construction worker glasses. Yeah. Yeah, they will work. They will work. Yep. For 20, for 20 hours? How many, how many hours do you do? Well, well, uh, well, I, well the title, again, just to highlight, is The Art, right? So uh, I, I'm very artful in my approach. No day is the same for me. Uh, I like to tune in real time presently to how I'm feeling and what I have going on to decide how I'm going to approach it. But um, for instance, with my group of clients, we will do often together a group 24-hour fast uh, where we're holding each other accountable doing this fast together at the same time on the same day and so we're able to celebrate together and having planned, you know, you can plan ahead of time with having a great meal the night before and plan uh, after to have a great meal after. So I'll do a 24-hour fast uh, at least once a month. Uh, I've done a 48-hour fast three times. I'm interested in the three- to five-day fasting, and it might seem crazy to a lot of people in here. And like I said, consult with your doctors. Don't just go out and try fasting without guidance. This needs guidance, especially if you're doing extended fasting. But there's this uh, scientific term called uh, 
autophagy. If you want to look up autophagy, this is the science of your cells eating themselves. Okay, and that might seem like a bad thing, but it actually helps them rege regenerate. So at hours 48 on, after a two-day fast of no food, your body's able to tap into autophagy, which is one of the best ways to support longevity, to recycle your cells. Uh, and I mean, because if you, if you look at it, what also happens with intermittent fast with fasting is it cleanses out overreactive muscle cells and white and red blood cells. So it actually can help you put, put, put on better muscle and it can help you in your immune system, cycling out overreactive white and red blood cells. So this is more than just like, oh, I'm going to burn fat because it's about how I look. Look, like, no, this is a longevity hack. And I encourage you to do your research. Uh, but it can be really, really powerful. I just stumbled on just recently. Yeah. I was looking at the top and that it's yeah. super good for brain health to go faster. Yes. I had never heard that before. Crazy, right? Yeah. How much water do you drink during that fast, though? Oh, good question. Yeah. Um, so, and that is important to focus on hydration. Uh, getting good quality water in and maybe even sea salt in your water. Um, I, you know, I haven't measured it. It's typically probably around the same, maybe a little bit more than, than other days. But also have, if you want to switch it up, you can have like non-caloric. Like technically you can have a coffee on a fast, it's no calories. But some people actually can have a blood glucose response to caffeine by itself. It's really interesting. So, so look out for that. Uh, but like sparkling water to switch it up, I'll have. Um, Correct. This is a water fast, yeah. Yep. Yeah, good question. Good question. And it can really, yeah, go ahead. I'm curious about your cell phone. <laughs> the flip phone, yeah. And I'm so much, yeah. What percentage of, depending on the time on the phone, what percentage of yeah. EMS? Yes, great question. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, there's some quote, I might have been Mark Twain, and, and who said, when the majority of people are on one side in the world, consider doing the opposite, right? Apple, Steve Jobs may have said that as well. And, and I mean, if you look at the tech leaders out there who created these devices, they're on record as saying, like, I wouldn't, wouldn't let my child use this device at all or as much as possible, you know, at certain ages. So, so there's that. Um, but for me, it was to also limit my texting, although I've run into a challenge, because when I do text on this, it's really hard, because it's T9. Because I have issues in my tissues, as I say, and my thumbs, like I can, I need like a weekly chair massage to help me work out some of my kinks. Um, so uh, anyways, it was about the EMFs as well, and, and all the, but, but also the apps, and the, the quick response, you can get on the internet whenever you want, and, and I just wanted more freedom in that area, and it was something I wanted to test, frankly, and, um, I might go back or might use this as my burner and get an iPhone too because, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, so good question. I left my phone in Jim's car last night with the same reason I didn't feel like it all night long. Oh, yeah. So I, I didn't have it last night. I didn't realize it. <coughs> and he was off for work this morning. I went home. And that just went through my phone with how I took the tablet and the phone. I didn't realize it. Oh. It was so peaceful. Oh. Okay. Give me a chair. Nice. Great chair. I appreciate that. You drove that. her drug back to her phone. <laughs> uh, you drove her drug back her phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, you know, these are amazing tools, but because they can be addictive, we lose sight of our intention around wanting to take intentional breaks. You know, that's why number 16 is taking tech breaks. And it, I really appreciate you sharing that, and it's something that we we just need to remember because a lot of us before like pre pre ta like handheld devices that's how we lived <laughs> yeah it's crazy right <laughs> yes any other last questions here yes uh, thanks for asking yeah uh, so I mentioned the presence process book and what they um, so there's that sort of breathing where you're, where you're sitting down meditating. Um, or, or he calls them breathing exercises because you just focus simply on a mantra. Uh, that's I am here now 
in this. So that's my favorite way to set my morning up is to do a 15 minute breathing exercise where I'm repeating those words in sync with my breath. So I on an inhale am on an exhale here now in this. That's one example of a breathing exercise. I've also tapped into some of Wim Hof's work. Uh, if some people might be familiar with Wim Hof, this is a thinky deaky Dutchman who's known for uh, winning Guinness records of being able to handle a certain like 10 minutes of ice cold water or like hiking, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Mount Everest and shorts and a t-shirt, you know, like this guy's a crazy dude that uses cold therapy and breath work to tap into its body's natural ability to like heal itself and regenerate and oxygenate your cells. So Wim Hof is a, like a, it's like a short term way to hyperventilate. And so do, do that under supervision and guidance or, you know, consult with your doctor, but it can be a great way to flood your body with energy. Um, uh, other ones are the alternate nostril one that I mentioned. And, and what I learned from my partner, my girlfriend, um, Amanda up here, who's an amazing chef and um, a Pilates instructor, is how so often that um, we'll either not be a intent, uh, focus on our breath at all, like we won't be connected with it, or we'll just focus on like stomach breathing, uh, as opposed to like really using our lungs and focus on like like chest breathing, like she would always say to me, like, or not chest breathing, uh, like breathing, go, you, will you explain it? So your rib cage. You don't want to breathe into your chest. You don't want to breathe into your chest, but. Breathing into the rib cage. Yeah, breathing into the, the yes. The lungs where the most oxygen is taken. And the, the lower, lower, lower lobes, lobes of the lungs. It's called like yoga breathing to your belly, which is great for relaxing your back, breathing in and out of your chest. So like placing your, your hands on your rib cage and trying to expand <sighs> Yeah. Yep. How do you find that out? How do you find that out? Yeah, I mean, what, is there something you can... Well, finding a local Pilates instructor could be someone that could guide you in, in changing how you breathe with that, yeah. There you go. Yep. <laughs> so you can probably relate and speak to all of this. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great questions, guys. It's been, one more question over here? No. Oh, you're just waving. You're just like, goodbye. You're right, you're right. Hi. Hi. It's been a blessing to have you guys be a part of this night. I hope it was of value. It seems like most of you got a copy of the book. Like I said, if you want the slides, uh, feel free to text me your name and email and, uh, and or come up afterwards and ask me any questions. It's been a delight to serve you all. Happy health hacking. And here's the elevating your state of health and performance together. Oh, the recipes. Ah, I love it. Here they are. So the best Brussels sprouts you'll ever eat. <laughs> and we've got the sweet potato cauliflower mash. This might be timely. Yeah. We've got grain-free chocolate chip cookies. Eating for pleasure and for performance. Anyone? Drop the guilt. Grain-free sugarless sugar cookies. Well, like I said, if people want the slides, they can text me your name and email, and I'll follow up. I'll send you the slides. They're, these recipes are... On the slides, they're at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Kitchen chemistry. About a year from now, our cookbook will come out. So look out for that. It's called Kitchen Chemistry. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, buddy.